Psalm chapter 45. My heart is igniting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Notice how the psalmist says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Talking about the doctrine of inspiration, how we got our, our, our Bible, which ties into our lesson tonight that wasn't planned. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces, whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions, shall, that follow her shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought they shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Let's remain standing for some singing. All right, turn to hymn number 729. 729. God can do anything but fail. standing as we open in prayer. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our ministry service. And God, we know that you can do all things as displayed, Lord, through a magnificent power as you created the heaven and the earth. God, you created us and everything therein. And Father, we know that you can move mountains, oh God, as your word says, and then it's displayed through the people's lives in the Bible, oh God. So I just pray that we would continue, Lord, to have faith in you. Lord, we know that you can do things in our lives as well. So, Lord, I just pray that we would take those things that matter, Lord, in prayer to you. And, Lord, just thank you, Lord, for doing all things and having all things done, Lord, for us. So, Lord, we ask that you would just bless um, this service tonight. Lord, be with your people. Help us to remember, God, that you can do all things. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go through announcements as we prepare to take up our offering this evening. Of course, our candy sale begins tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. The candy is there, and it's smelling up my basement, and we're ready to get it out where it needs to go. Pray for the sale. Pray for safety and for our, our goals to be attained. We are still selling on Friday. Um, but the young people that are in our care, I'll leave that up to you parents. They can head, if they're of age, they can head with us to the, the youth rally. And uh, of course, they'll be providing dinner there, so they will be set. They'll just need their lunch. But we can sell pretty close up until the time that it's time to go to the youth rally and, and kind of help you with that since we already have them. And the youth rally on Friday night will be at Beecher Fellowship Baptist Church. The Bible quiz is over Proverbs 19 through 21. There is vocal and instrumental competition. Make sure you're practice, but more than anything, make sure your heart, your heart is in it and that your heart is right, right. as you um, compete and try to be a blessing to those folks. Saturday, men's and women's prayer meeting at 9 o'clock, bus and soul winning at 9.30. Um, if you have a cell phone, please power it off at this time. And then bus captains, I have a quick meeting with you after the service is over. Ushers, if you can come, mother-daughter banquet is coming up really, 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 really quickly, April the 26th. Uh, that is at 6.30 p.m. The cost is $12 for adults, $9 for ages 5 and under if you're eating. Mrs. Mimi Potts will be the guest speaker. She did... Uh, a good job last year. The, she was a blessing to the ladies, and so we invited her to come again. Um, it's a success, I believe, um, if the gospel is presented and if you have lost people there to hear the gospel. And so let me encourage you to bring out the ladies and have a good night of fellowship on the 26th. Marvin, if you would come and ask the Lord to bless as we give tonight. Let's pray, Father. Just want to, of course, just thank you, Lord, for the fact that you've given us life and, Lord, and life in abundance. And, Lord, you take care of all of our, our wants and our needs, oh, God, and you're, you're so good to us. And so I just pray that as we are here tonight, Lord, that you would, um, God, just be with us as we listen to your word. I pray that we would want to get closer to you, especially during this time, Lord, with all the wickedness going on today in the world, that we would not want to adopt the world's doctrines, God, but stay in your word, continue to learn and continue to grow as you'd want us to, to, to be um, eating meat, Lord, and not on the milk. And so I just pray that you would be with the, the listeners, but also, Lord, I do pray that you would be with the offering as we take it up, praying, God, that we want to worship you and be right in this area of giving, God, knowing that we can never outgive you, Lord, we can Never do more than what you do for us, God, but I just pray that we want to, to, to honor and reverence you, Lord, through the things that you've given us, God. It's temporal, God, so I just pray that we would just treat it um, with respect, Lord, be good stewards of it, and just give back to you. So we're thankful for this opportunity to listen to your word, God, and we're thankful for the opportunity to give unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
pictures have the microphone, we're going to have a testimony service. We did this uh, just briefly on Saturday morning before we went out. But uh, the testimonies, I want to limit them to blessings from the conference, spiritual blessings from the conference, something that the Lord did in your family, in your heart, in your life through the conference, and you want to testify because of it. And so if you have one of those types of testimonies, um, let me encourage you to uh, take a few moments and share it with the church and be a blessing to us as well. So would anyone like to start us off? Tamara. She's got the mic, or he's got the mic. There it is. Yes, so um, I we've got a strong concordance. For some reason, I always thought we had it, but that was the way of life. Um, so just in my heart, I wanted to make sure that I studied to show myself approved, and I could never really confidently say that I lived that verse. But now just having more Bible materials and being more adamant about having those when I do my daily devotions is wonderful. I've been using the Strong's in my devotions, and it's enhanced so much um, of God's word, just looking up um, the different meanings. And then, of course, um, having my friend out for the conference, just, again, she comes from a very urban environment. I didn't know how it would be, but God really spoke to her heart and on so many things. So just seeing God's word work um, in hearts, it, it, was, it, it was amazing. So I'm just grateful for all the preachers and just adamantly making sure that I want to be a studier and know God's word and have an answer for every man. Very good. Any other conference testimonies? Marvin. Um, just throughout the even studying, um, for what was going to be preached um, and then definitely listening to the, the messages as well. I just got a sense of heaviness, um, wanting the responsibility to give out the gospel to, to others. I mean, I've always known that it's, it's like something um, with, with a lot of weight to it, but just listening to it over and over. I mean, we someday someone could be in hell because we didn't give them the gospel. And, and so just just knowing that, you know, the Lord will always be with me when I go to do these things. So it's not like I'm, I'm by myself, but it, it gave me a renewed sense of I need to be out there and not just talking about how, how's the weather today or how's school, but really get into those weighty matters. Are you saved through Jesus Christ? And so um, very welcome and very heavy and the responsibility I definitely felt, but knowing that the Lord is with me when I do it. Good, very good. Any other conference-related testimonies? Portia, just throw it real hard, like a football. While we're getting to her, I'll just say that one big blessing for me during the conference was just to see the Lord bless it, just to see him answer our prayers, the fasting and all of the hard work that went into it just to see what God did and how it was a blessing to other people. Um, that was a blessing to me. And um, I don't think I'll ever forget how special it was just to see the Lord work um, in that way. So, Portia. I think the thing that I noticed or that was an encouragement or blessing to me was just how much our church had done and how much of a blessing we were to the people that were here and to our visitors. And I remember the first year when Pastor Lewis said, we're gonna do a conference, just <laughs> if anybody remembers that year and then remembers just this last conference, it's just a huge difference. And you can see growth. You can see that we just really stepped up. It wasn't just people coming to help us or serving us. At our conference, we were serving others, and it was just um, just like a milestone, you know, growth-wise. It didn't just feel like a bunch of services. It actually felt like a real conference, and I just was blessed by that. Yeah, and I would add to it, I remember for 
uh, as a church plant, we were for many years on the receiving end of a lot of um, outside help. And I remember Portia saying, I, I can't wait till one day we can be a blessing to other people in the ways they've been a blessing to us. And um, it, it is exciting to, to know that he doesn't just want to bless us, but he wants us to be a blessing, our church, our church. And that, that, was, that was good. Any other conference-related testimonies? Julie. Yeah, I, um, I just love the way um, iron sharpened iron, as uh, far as each preacher um, had a different way of, of preaching, um, giving the gospel, but it was tied in the same. So you could tell the Holy Spirit was, was with it. But even also just to get to know the pastors and see their heart, um, sometimes we, we, we watch them on, on, um, online or whatever, but to truly get to see them and, and, and see their heart, like uh, Brother Cloud, how he's more open-minded than I thought <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and he's totally different than Pastor Winokur and it just was just edifying. So just, just to see how it all came together for one cause, so I, I, that was good. Yeah, it's good to be around men of God. I also noticed that the more acquainted um, Brother Cloud the more acquainted he is with our church over time, the more he lets that um, sense of humor of his be known. And, it, you know, and I, that, that to me is fun. I enjoy being around preachers. Any other conference related testimony? Crystal and then Justine. Crystal and then Justine. Um, I, I enjoyed all of the conference. I think it was. I think it worked on my heart way more than I expected it to. Um, you know, going into keeping the kids, I was super excited because I knew how practical it was going to be for our family. But I, I have to say, I wasn't as like expectant of this conference. I don't know why. Um, and actually, the week before the conference happened, I told some of the ladies this, but I had a patient um, take his own life, and mm. that was very awful and really hard on me, but I also think it really prepared my heart for the conference because just sort of put it in my face that we don't know when the last time we're going to talk to someone is. You know, I, I operated on him the day before and I never mm. would have guessed and um, so it just really, I think, put things in perspective and um, so I'm just thankful that even through hard things, you know, God is, is working and I think he really used that to help me get as much as I could out of the conference. Man, and we're already planning next year's conference and we're um, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do a year from now in the conference. Any other, Justine? Um, so, Pastor Lee Casey had Hold the mic up so we can hear you, there we go. Pastor Lee Casey had said in, um, I think it was the first sermon on Monday, he was. He told a story um, about how the woman, she had um, two girls and a son, and the son had died tragically. And she said that um, Pastor Whitaker went to her house to um, kind of comfort her, and she kept on saying that she wished she had known, and she wished she had known like over and over again. And Pastor Whitaker said that we do know that the Lord is going to come back, and we do know that he's going to judge the people who aren't saved. So we should be giving them the gospel now and not let that um One or two more conference-related testimonies. Sabrina? <clears throat> well, this is my first one because I've been missing the other ones because I've been gone like five years, I think. So I was kind of nervous at first about it because I didn't know what to expect. But once it got started, I opened up more and I wasn't afraid anymore. And it helped me now more when I go out soul winning to be more of a soul winner, actually open up and talk to people more about their salvation. And I don't let people go past me like one of, you know how you let one or two go past you? Nah, I'm pulling them down, stopping them. And now it's a lot of young people coming my way. God's sending a lot of young men my way. 
and I understand why. So I want to say thank you for this conference, and I can't wait till next year yeah. to get more fed. Uh, man, this soul winning is good. Yeah, and I you, love it. You come out of more. a set of meetings like that, and you yeah. see people as souls, not just bodies. Exactly, instead of just a person on the yeah. street just walking by, pass and say hi, hi, wait, <gasps> got something to tell you. It's good. It's good. Amen. That's the purpose. That was the purpose. One more. Lois. Um, so sometimes I get discouraged when I like sow a lot of seeds and the person doesn't really get saved or they're not interested. And so when Pastor Whitaker said that um, a lot of times, sadly, we're just taking people's excuses away mm. and um, so that the blood isn't on our hands and we're giving them the gospel and, and a lot do get saved, but then a lot don't because we're taking the excuse away and the blood off of our hands. And so that was encouraging, but then like it helped me to be a little, not aggressive, but like try to show them and whenever I give out a chat, like maybe say a verse and so a seed that really they won't have an excuse when they stand before God. So that was really encouraging. I'll also add that I felt Saturday was very special afterwards. Mm. And I, I felt and sensed the spirit as we went out like never before. And um, I hope it won't, I hope it won't, those fires won't burn out as we get further and further away from the conference that we'll always remember what God did in our hearts um, through the preach word about our responsibility to do Christ's business. Okay, let's have some more singing. All right, let's stand for our last hymn tonight. Hymn number 811, 811, His Name is Wonderful. Sing this hymn two times. evening I was talking to Marlon and I was explaining to him that every Bible believing church should be a Bible college and we want to continue to grow in our learning and we've got a lot of irons on the fire uh, we are going to finish courtship biblical courtship 
we're going to finish the book of Nehemiah. And um, we're, some of you think I've forgotten about Baptist history. We're going to finish Baptist history. We've got all of these irons on the fire, a lot of things cooking uh, from our pulpit ministry. But one of the things that I uh, definitely feel we should highlight this year, and we won't do a bunch, uh, we won't finish uh, this course, but we'll do some until we finish, and that is Brother Cloud's course on why we use the King James Bible. Complementing that course, if you're interested, is his book, with, and these, this does have the right notes in it uh, for the course, and so uh, this is in our bookstore, uh, but he takes lots of time in the videos to discuss why we use the King James Bible. I'll just say this, it's not enough to say, I go to a church, we use the King James Bible. Uh, do you know why? And uh, that's what this course is about, and that's what we're going to be learning. These were recorded last year. He did an old version of it. Our family watched it on family vacation this past year. He did an old version of it years ago, but he redid it um, at Pastor Boots Church down in Virginia just at the end of last year. And I was able to introduce uh, Brother Cloud and Brother Boots to each other on the Israel trip. And um, that's how Brother Cloud was invited to go down there and do the conference on why we use the King James Bible. And it went very well. And so I'm excited about looking at these videos together. So we'll get started with the introductory video. Our subject this week is the author's person. That's not the subject. Why we hold to the King James Bible, but our subject this section is the author's personal testimony about the Bible version issue. And we have our textbooks, and as we said in the last session, uh, we would urge you to take this seriously and focus your attention. And, uh, and uh, we're in Bible college this week. And I'm thankful for the pastor willing to do this kind of thing, to educate his people. Very important, very rare. I was not trained formally in the defense of the King James Bible in any sense. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church in Florida, and uh, <clears throat> like we all did at about age 11, I came down front during a vacation Bible school that summer, and I professed Christ as my Savior. I got baptized, and I became a church member, and I was just as lost as I had ever been. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Can a child be saved? Yes, if he's old enough to be saved. But if he is saved, he's saved. Not two plans of salvation for children and then for adults. Of course, they are children, but there's going to be a real change, especially in the attitude toward authority, in the attitude toward this book, there's going to be a new attitude toward a lot of things. And in my case, none of that was true. In fact, it was not long after that, as I reached my teenage years, uh, it was a dramatic turn toward the world very quickly. And music was the heart and soul of it. My parents did not allow us to uh, have rock and roll in the home. And, uh, but that was okay. The deacon's son was my buddy. And uh, he had a little 45 RPM rock uh, record player. I know a lot of you don't know it, but a lot of you are older and you do. And it was the dawn of portability of music. And he had one out in the barn. And his dad didn't care what he listened to. So I got it. I can't. I just, it was so amazing to me, that music, and what it did to me, and how it uh, stirred me up, but not for good, for rebellion and uh, started rebelling against my dad. And I left as soon as I could, left church and uh, went to where my heart already was, which was the world. And then I got drafted in the army. I um, went to Vietnam, came back from there, started using drugs in Vietnam. That's where I started using marijuana. I was in a military police unit in Tonsonut Air Base, right by Saigon. And, uh, and uh, our job was to keep drugs from being shipped out of the country. 
And uh, this is the, this 1971, and that's when the Vietnam thing, everybody over there knew it was finished. There's no winning this thing. It's just, let's stay alive. And that's when the drug became a big problem in Vietnam. It was not that way earlier in the 60s. And I was right in the middle of that drug thing. So I came back to the States. I had lost all of my goals. I had wanted to go back, finish college thing. I lost all of that and just went down to Hollywood, Florida, built a little hippie pad and a couple of my raunchy buddies. I got arrested and that scared me. I was selling drugs a little bit for a living and just a nut and uh, got arrested. That scared me. And so I decided I was going to go to South America. Me and my buddies were going to go to South America on bicycles without any preparation or training. We bought bicycles and we sold things we had and bought equipment. We were well equipped, but not in any shape to do that. So we headed out one, one morning uh, from Lakeland, Florida. We're headed to South America, the three of us. And we got to Dade City that evening. It was only 20 miles. But by then we had decided that's not the way to travel. So we put the bicycles on a Greyhound bus. That's the way to ride a bicycle and ended up in New Orleans, sold it, and then started hitchhiking. That began my hitchhiking days. Went all the way out to California, came back, got, a, got involved in Hinduism, and I was in a mess. And summer of 1973, I was driving my car, was not hitchhiking at that time. I was driving my car out of Hollywood, Florida, and I saw this man with a bicycle riding a bicycle with a big pack. Now that's what I had wanted to do, and I thought, this is interesting, I'll stop. And I said, you know, where are you going? I'm going to Mexico. I said, oh. I said I'll said i give you a ride as far as I'm going, Lakeland, Florida, 200 miles up the road. He said, great, let's go. And so we started talking about the Bible. And he pulled a little Bible out of his pocket, pocket Bible, and he was a good Christian, and he knew his Bible very well. And, uh, and I was full of all kinds of New Age stuff and Hindu stuff and who knows what. And so I started giving him my opinions, religious opinions about everything. And I said, I believe in following your heart. I'm following my heart. He said, well, that's, that won't work. Why not? Because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I said, the Bible says that. I was a Baptist, but I didn't know anything about Bible. He said, it did. he showed it to me, and it, w it went on like that. I would tell him, I believe in reincarnation. He said, but the Bible says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after death, the judgment. And he would show me those verses, and he would kindly, patiently refute what I was thinking. And, uh, and I went to Mexico with him. I got so interested in that conversation for a while. And then I decided I didn't want to be with him because he was contradicting everything I believed. And at that time, I did not believe the Bible at all. And so he said, well, I'm going to go on down into Mexico. We're, we're, we were just a little ways into Mexico in Brownsville, Texas, and uh, across Brownsville, Texas. And he said, I'm, I'm going to go on. I said, well, I'm going back to Florida. And he said, well, can I go with you? And I didn't want him to go with me, but I, I, I didn't say no. So we went back to Florida, but we, we, he was kind of quiet, and I was tired of it. And back home, my mom and dad were praying. Back home, my grand, godly grandmother was praying, prayer warrior, fasting and prayer. She understood that. They were praying for me, and uh, so we got back to Daytona Beach, Florida, got a motel room to get cleaned up, the final night together, and God saved me. And I mean 100% saved me. I was uh, disputing the Bible one day and the next day. And ever since, I've been a Bible, 50 years, I've been a 100% Bible believer. And it was salvation. Salvation is a big thing. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away. And so don't, don't look for anything less than a new creature in your kids. 
far in yourself. And so I went to Bible college a year later, and I took a course in, and by the way, I want you to look at two verses with me. The man that led me to Christ gave me, gave me a whole Bible education in that four days. I don't remember much of it, but I remember two verses, actually four, but these two, Acts 17, 11, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, Acts 17, 11, because the whole issue was, what is the authority? That, that was our conversation. What's the authority? I'm trusting my heart. I'm, you know, this, that, and the other. Man's writings. What's the authority? And he kept saying, the Bible. Acts 17, 11, And so he taught me to test everything by the Bible. And when I got saved, that was my beginning Christian mindset. The Bible's the Word of God. The Bible's the infallible Word of God. I'm going to test everything by it so I won't be deceived. That man gave me that thinking, and he gave me these two verses, which I had already memorized by the time I was saved, just spending that time with him. Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received, they received the Word with all readiness of mind, they received it, and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. And so, a te biblical testing mindset is what those Bereans were commended for. Uh, and, that, and he was a Pentecostal man, and he gave me that kind of thinking. The night I got saved, he prayed that I would speak in tongues. About scared me to death. I didn't know what tongues was all about. And, uh, and I've never seen that man since. His name was Ron Walker, and he was just traveling around on a bicycle preaching. And the last I saw him, he was heading out from Hollywood, Florida, Mexico. I've never heard of him since. But he taught me to test everything by the Bible. And that is, that is a very important thing. And you can't test anything by the Bible unless you know the Bible. If you've been saved sometime and you're still not very skillful in the Bible, you're in great danger today. You're just depending on the man, what my preacher says. You're in danger. I don't want to be in danger. I know there are dangers. I know there is a devil. I know that there is, there is false teaching. I know we lived at the end of the uh, church age, and I know about apostasy, and I don't want to be deceived. I was deceived. I believed 100% what I believed before I was saved. I believed it, but I was deceived, and I don't want to be deceived again. One time I went to Las Vegas, and I was, uh, wanting to, I was praying for a guitar, and I... Uh, a guitar so I could sing rock and roll songs so I could sing uh, My Sweet Lord, which was George Harrison's song to uh, Hindu God. And that's what I, where I was, and I was praying. I was a man of prayer for a guitar. And I went to Las Vegas and I won, I think it was $70. And I thought, answer the prayer. And I bought a guitar and I started trying to learn it to play my sweet Lord to a Hindu God who answered that prayer the devil if anybody but the devil and I never want to be deceived again and Christianity after I got saved I didn't know where to go to church all the churches and all the doctrines and where do you go and here test everything by the Bible and then in 1 Thessalonians 5 21 this was the other verse very similar 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. This is a pretty short verse, easy to memorize. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So we are supposed to test everything by the Word of God, not by our opinions, by what we've seen in some other church, by the Word of God. That is the sole authority for faith and practice. And that man that led me to Christ taught me that, and I started my Christian life out like that. And when I started looking for a church, that was what I was going to do. Find a church that believes the Bible, test the churches by the Bible, 
And I thank God for that. Fifty years later, I have the same principle. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. You've got to understand the doctrine of apostasy. It is a clearly taught doctrine in the Bible and uh, that, that there's going to be a great turning away from the truth among professing Christians. They will not endure sound doctrine. Second Timothy 4, 3 and 4 summarizes it. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, heaps of teachers. That's where we live today, heaps of teachers. Uh, the internet is full of them, millions of them teaching all kinds of things. And that's where we live. And that was prophesied in the Bible 2,000 years ago, that it would happen, that the church in, throughout the church age, the apostasy, the turning away would increase. 2 Timothy 3.13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I don't want to be deceived. So, got to know this book. I've got to know what this book is. Is it truly the Word of God? And then I've got to make this the book of my life. I went to Bible college and went there, Tennessee Temple, took all the courses I could get and uh, took a course in Greek. We were required to use the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament, third edition, but right after I got saved, I knew nothing about Bible verses. The man that led me to Christ bought me a big King James Bible as we were traveling. Big old huge thing. No reference, nothing, just Bible. And a Strong's Concordance. That was the library I had starting my Christian life about. Strong's Concordance, big King James Bible. And I wore out, literally, that Strong's Concordance that first year, learning the words, studying the Bible. I don't want to be deceived. Therefore, I've got, to, I've got to learn the Bible. I've got to know the Bible. And if you don't know the words, you don't know the Bible. And so I started out, but one day I decided I, I wanted one of the new versions. And I went down to the Southern Baptist Bookstore at that time on Main Street in Lake of Florida and uh, went into the bookstore, talked to the lady behind the counter, and I said, I, I want one of the modern versions. So easier to read for me. She said, I don't recommend it. That was a long time ago. We're talking about 1973. I don't recommend it. Well, they do recommend it today. And she said, I, but I was persistent. I really want something easier to read. She said, well, I guess the easiest to read would be the today's English version. Good news for modern man. I said, well, give me one of those. So I took it on and I read right through it. That New Testament, just, I'm a fast reader. I just read through it. And I thought, that's not the Word of God. They say it reads like the morning newspaper. Yeah, but I don't read the morning newspaper twice. That's not the Word of God. And so I went on, but I didn't understand. I just understand I, that's not the Word of God. And I went to Bible college. Oh, I got a Dixon Analytical Study Bible someone recommended. And that particular study Bible, all through, out, it has, uh, I think it was brackets, but it, it, was, it said the better readings, and it was full of those. But I, I didn't pay any attention to them. Mostly I just skipped over. Didn't know anything about this issue. Went to Bible college, got that uh, 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 Greek New Testament, still didn't know anything about the issue. Came across some Ruckmanites at uh, Bible, Bible college. They were causing a lot of trouble. And, uh, but still I didn't know anything about the issue. And so God called me to be a missionary. My wife was a missionary in Nepal before we were married. I, uh, I got saved in 73. In 74, I went to Bible college. By that time, I was 24. And by that time, my wife had already finished Bible college. And she believed that God called her to be a missionary to Nepal. They, they were studying and had a course on missions at Bible College, Tennessee Temple. And she believed that God spoke directly to her heart that that's where she's supposed to go. But the problem was it was totally closed. And the only way you could go there as a missionary at that particular time was medical work. So she became a nurse. 
just so she could go to Nepal because she believed that's where God called her. And, by the, and so by the time I got to Tennessee Temple at age 24, she was finished with all that. We're the same age. And she was just on the verge of leaving Chattanooga to go to Nepal to be a missionary nurse. Mainly she wanted to be just a missionary. But she's the most amazing person. She's the most amazing soul winner I've ever met. And I'm not talking about one, two, three stuff. I'm talking about loving people to Christ. And everywhere she goes, people get saved. That was her plan. And uh, while she was in Chattanooga, while she was in Bible College in Erlanger Hospital and her medical, she had, a, she had attended this little church in Tracy City, Tennessee real true hillbillies and when i got to tennessee temple i went up there with a with a buddy to see if i might want to work up there during my college years and that sunday morning i met linda for the first time and i found out she's going to nepal she uh and and that was the end of my interest because i didn't have any interest in nepal and therefore not really any interest in her and we got to know each other for about six weeks, just briefly riding up to the chapel and things. And uh, she left and went to Nepal. And I stayed there at Tennessee Temple. And I started writing to her. And, uh, and I started writing to her. And a year later, I wrote and asked her to marry me. And I said in that letter, I'm, I'm sure God wants us to get married. But I am sure God doesn't want us to go to Nepal. And, um, and so that was the terms. That was my terms. It wasn't God's terms. And it wasn't her terms either. We got married. She came back to the States. We got married. And in 1979, we went to Nepal together as missionaries. And so we wanted to, one thing we wanted to do was make a concordance in the Nepali Bible. They didn't have a concordance. A concordance is a magnificent Bible study tool. Yeah. And as we started talking with pastors there at that time, and uh, even the head of the Bible Society, Nepal Bible Society, it was clear that that particular, that that existing Nepali Bible was not good enough to base a concordance on. They needed a new Bible. And that's when I began to study the Bible version issue for myself and try to figure this thing out. And that's when I began corresponding with men like David Otis Fuller, and some men that were still alive then or are now dead that were major voices in defense of the King James Bible. And I began to get a serious education in that issue. And God led me to the position that I had today. But it's not just I use the King James Bible because the man that led me to Christ gave me a King James Bible because my godly grandmother used the King James Bible. I know why I use the King James Bible. And I'm informed and, and, and I have a passion to help God's people in this matter. A passion. And so, God helped me to come to this position. It is fundamental. Absolutely fundamental. But you know what's more fundamental? Salvation. Salvation. It is the fundamental of fundamentals. No church can ever, ever rest on its laurels. There's no such thing as a church that's solid because everything's always changing. People are always changing. Their lives are always changing. Their families are always changing. People are coming. People are going. Children are growing up. And every one of those children must be born again. Must be born again. And you can sit here this morning in, in the comfort of your family that they're Christians. In this church, we're Christians, and you might not be saved. And if, 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 if Christ were to come right now, and he could, you would be left behind. The fundamental of fundamentals is salvation. And that's, that's the fundamental to us and to our ministry in Nepal. We're working a lot these days with druggy type guys, like I was, and uh, young men that have gotten really messed up with drugs in Nepal, not covered with tattoos and 
working with them. And they, and they have to agree. We don't have any lockdown ministry. There's no, there's no jail. They, a young man has to be willing to come and live with our Bible college graduates and basically to live in a hostel with Bible college graduates and live under the rules and stay there of his own accord. And what we do is immerse them in the Word of God. And they have to agree to stay two months. Some of them don't. But those that do invariably get saved by being immersed in the Word of God. And we're seeing dramatic conversions, powerful conversions. We've got to see conversions. That's God's first business. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's his first business. That's his heartbeat. Nothing of the other things matter until you're saved. You won't care about the Bible till you're saved. This kind of thing won't really excite you till you're saved. That's what makes all the difference. And that's what we've got to do in our homes. We've got to fill our homes up with the Word of God. Fill them up with the Word of God quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God, it is powerful. One of the reasons we know that this absolutely is the infallible Word of God is its power. It's life-changing power. I, when I met the man that led me to Christ, I didn't believe the Bible. I was absolutely opposed to the Bible. That's how far I had gone from Sunday school. One time I was hitchhiking, and I was in Panama City, Florida. And I, I walked down by the Gulf of Mexico, loved the ocean, grew up around it. And I was walking along on the sidewalk there, and I was thinking to go out on a little dock there in the water and sit down for a while, and I saw a box of Bibles on the sidewalk, box of Gideon Bible. I looked around, there's no, there's nobody there, no store, a box of Gideon Bibles. So I, I got one and I walked down to that little dock and I sat down and I thought, you know, it's been a long time since I've ever opened the Bible. And so I think I'll just, you know, open it up. And I did that in a real popular Bible study. I just flipped it open and I, flipped it open to Mark chapter 9, just so happens. You know what's in Mark chapter 9? It's a red-hot sermon on hell. <laughs> One of Jesus' red-hot sermons on hell. If your, if your church doesn't preach red-hot sermons on hell, it's not a biblical church. And people say, well, Jesus was just a buddy with sinners. He was a friend of sinners, the friend of sinners, but when he went to parties, he preached on hell, and I, that will mess up any party. Absolutely. And so I, I flipped it open in Mark chapter 9, and three times here, Jesus said, Where their worm dieth, it says, Whatsoever thy hand offend thee, whatso and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, my hand. For it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Sounds like there's fire in hell, doesn't it? Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Sounds like there's fire in hell. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. My foot, it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Sounds like there's fire there. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. He's not finished. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Sounds like there's fire there. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I read that. I flipped it open to that. Exactly what I needed. But I said, I don't, to myself, I don't agree with that. What about people that's never heard? and all that kind of thing. I, didn't, I did not agree with the Bible. I didn't agree with the Bible. Isn't that stupid? Who am I? 
I don't know anything. I've never died and come back. I don't know anything. And yet, I didn't agree with the Bible. And that's the condition I was in when I met that godly man that led me to Christ. I did not believe the Bible. I mean, I really did not believe the Bible. And it was the Bible that saved me. The book I didn't agree with. He just quoted scripture. We've got to know the scripture. I was glad to see the, 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 the memory verse program you had. We've got to know the scripture. And what if they don't believe it? Just give it to them. Just give it to them. That's what God's going to use. Not your arguments and all your... It's the word of God. But what if they don't believe it? Just give it to them. What if my kids don't believe it? Just give it to them. What if those druggies we're working with don't believe it? Just give it to them. And it works. It's powerful. It is so powerful. We need to fill our lives up with this book. Not just know uh, where it came from in its history like this week, but fill our lives up with it. I have a passion for young people, for young people to know how to study the Bible. I have a passion for that. Ever since I've had grandkids, I've had a growing passion for young people. And, uh, and then, you know, my grandkids are becoming teenagers, and this growing passion that each one of them, every single one of them, will be a serious Bible student, will know how, know how to it. And you, this is a big book. It's an old book. The earliest part of it is 2,000 years old. There's nothing new about this book. It's not a modern book. You've got to learn it. You've got to study. And the more you understand how to study the Bible, how to understand the, the Bible, how to understand books, how to interpret a passage, how to understand words, the more exciting it gets. The geography. I teach my grandkids. I, on one of the trips last year, I think, I taught them that week a course on introduction to Bible geography. And I bought them a, a couple of my favorite uh, uh, atlases, Bible atlases, for my grandkids, 13, 14, 17, 18, for my grandkids. Because I want them to be a serious Bible student, and you, you can't be unless you learn these things. That's a passion that I have so that our churches will be much stronger than I think they ever have been. I believe we can have churches today that are stronger than any churches we've had in my lifetime. That's how positive-minded I am. During COVID, I saw, living in Nepal, lockdown. We were locked in our house for months. I mean locked in the house. The international airport was closed for, I think, a year. It was closed. The country was just shut down. The United Nations taught us that. And they know what they're doing. But they, that's where we were. And I had a desire that we would come out of that stronger than ever as a church. And we did. And I'm very positive-minded about churches these days. That's why I was excited to come here. And... A church that wants to educate the people, that's a different kind of church with some serious education and have the, have the teenagers in the Sunday school with this kind of thing and encourage the teenagers to get their own textbook. That's exciting to me. One verse that God gave me in conclusion during COVID was Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. You know that verse? You know what the Great Commission is? This is a missionary church. This is planted as a missionary church. You support missionaries. You meet missionaries. I never met a missionary growing up. Never met a missionary. Only missionaries knew about were dead. Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus, um, well, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's a big job. That's a lot of stuff. Lo, here's the promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
That's aeon in Greek. That's age, the end of the age. God is working out his great plans in ages ever since the creation. And those ages go on into eternity. There's ages upon ages. That's the word eternal in Greek. Ages upon ages. And uh, Jesus said, in regard to this age, the church age, which will end with the rapture, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of it. And that's where we are. And that people look around and say, well, everything's going to pot. America's going to pot. All the churches are going to pot. It's just all going to pot. And so they're just very discouraged and disheartened and like giving up. We don't need to do that. Christ said, in the context of a church that's taking the Great Commission seriously, right down at the end of the age, I'm with you. And we're experiencing that in the fall. And that's my passion. And for that, we've got to do some very serious Bible teaching. But not just that. Teaching the people to interpret the Bible for themselves. I was in a church in Kansas last stop and the, they had a Bible Institute for years, three-year program. And I met some of the graduates of that Bible Institute in that church. And none of them knew how to study the Bible. They learned facts, but they did not learn how to study the Bible for themselves. Yeah, this is the preserve, infallible, preserved Word of God. It is. We're going to look at that this week. It is. There is no doubt about it. But what are we going to do with it? God bless you, Pastor. Thank you for viewing our live stream service today. We want to let you know that our service doesn't end with the conclusion of today's message. If you ever need anything from Cornerstone Baptist Church, if you need spiritual direction, if you need to more fully understand the doctrine of salvation, if you need uh, a listening ear, we want to let you know that we're here. We hope that you'll personally come and visit our services uh, soon at Cornerstone Baptist Church, but there is a number below that you can call if you need to speak with us. Thank you.